Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cozy Cushion. This morning we're enjoying some rain in Nova Scotia, and I thought it would be a fantastic time to sit down and have a coffee with you and continue a conversation from yesterday that I had on my Facebook uh, page, The Cozy Cushion. So I was on live there uh, for uh, a few minutes talking about my dreams. And I encourage you, if you watch this video, to kind of tune in to my Facebook page as well, because sometimes I post things there that I don't drop and leave on my YouTube page. It's kind of uh, a place where sometimes I may leave more personal stories and engage with that audience a little bit as best I can. And as you know, I don't edit my videos. Um, I don't use a script. I write down some thoughts. Uh, so basically everything I do is really raw and it's spontaneous and it's 100% real. So if you enjoy me, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate it. So those who know me, um, thank you for showing up. I appreciate your support in every way and I... Uh, I'm very grateful to you. Those who do not know me yet, my name is Natasha. I am the mentor and spiritual guide here at the Cozy Cushion, where we have old sacred space to have conversations about the things that mean most to us. So what that means for now is I'm going to have conversations and try to engage you in a way that we develop a relationship so that you understand who I am. And I also invite you uh, to also share with me. I want this to be a conversation, you know. So even though I'm here in my office on a rainy day, uh, having coffee with you and everything, I really want your feedback. I want your comments. I want to know your thoughts, feelings, passions, and dreams, and what makes a difference in your life. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, is uh, energy, spiritual strength, and how my life has changed. So this kind of continues on from a live video that I had yesterday. Um, so... When I was younger, um, I was born a really happy child for a little while. And then I had a few life circumstances that started to change things for me, which happens to absolutely everybody on earth. So I know we have this in common. But what that experience gave me was a completely different personality, a different way of thinking and conditioning and belief system. So for example, uh, when I was younger, when I was born, I was a spiritual being completely connected to God in the universe and was so comfortable and just happy in a state of joy. And then I switched slowly to forgetting that and moving into a human doing. So I became the person, you know, I became angry because my world didn't fit who I was and who I was becoming. So what changed for me is I became angry, I became anxious, I became depressed, I became very unhappy. And, and in a lot of ways, I think scared. Um, so when I was a human doing, how that felt for me was that life was hard. Everything was hard. Making money was hard. Being a mom was hard. Um, you know, I was on welfare, you know, and that was hard. The, iron the irony of that was it was viewed from human conditioning and other people in my life as 
it must be so nice. You're so lucky. You're so lucky to have welfare. You can sit around and raise a child and do nothing and get paid for it. And I thought that was a very interesting perspective because it wasn't mine. Um, so when I was a human doing, I lost the relationship with myself. You know, I didn't like a lot of things. I didn't like other people. I didn't like myself. I didn't care to learn, you know, I just, I had trouble making decisions. I had trouble being clear. I knew what I wanted, but there was just so many smackdowns and vampires and naysayers and so many other people, you know, to kind of feed, feed to this negative mentality, you know, so, you know, I worked, you know, once I was sick and tired of being on welfare as a single mom at 17 years old, you know, I, I, I got a job, you know, I started working for myself. I decided that I would clean houses and I had some very good friends that loved me and they gave me jobs cleaning their houses. And, you know, so I worked for myself. Unfortunately, it's ironic, but there were so many people in my life that still viewed me as not working, that I was on welfare. And it, it, it was very interesting. And, and when I was on welfare, I had caseworkers and social workers, which was great. Uh, but then once they found out I was working, they were like, maybe we should reassess your situation. And, you know, once you make a certain amount of money, you need to tell us because you won't be entitled to the same amount that we're giving you for, for free. So I was like, fair enough, you know? <laughs> and what I didn't realize was, even though I was making, a mo you know, making money, I worked for myself, I also got a secondary job where I worked for somebody else so I could learn new things. Even if I was able to keep those whole paychecks working 80 hours within two weeks, 40 hours a week. I had a secondary job cleaning houses for cash money, which I always, you know, I did on the side because that's how, you know, that's how we got things, you know, and it was never enough, ever, <laughs> ever, you know, it just wasn't en enough because there was always something. The car was breaking, the rent needed to be paid, uh, there was just, you know, always something. But then I started reading and I started thinking, there was a point in my life where I was addicted to drugs and I'll just give you a very short version of how that happened for me. So when I was really young, I, I grew up on a farm, so I had hippie parents, were, which was fantastic. I was allowed to be and do whatever I wanted, and I did. So at a very young age, I experimented with weed, you know, very young, and cigarettes and coffee. I was a coffee drinker. Actually, I'm having coffee today. So if you want to sit down and grab a coffee, that would be great because I would, I would love to have you sit with me. So... So I had tried these things because it was around me and even at a young age, I was like, okay, well, this is cool. It, you know, just, it makes me fit in. And, you know, I just thought, you know, I was old enough, smart enough. I thought I knew what I, w I was doing. And uh, so, so that was fine. Fast forward a little bit to when the pain started where things shifted from my spiritual happy baby self my young inner child to life conditioning taking hold and creating pain in my life and uncertainty when my parents divorced or around that time it was a series of events so it wasn't just their divorce but when everything changed for me I was separated from my animals my farm my family I was divided in half between you know, the, the life that I knew when I was brought home from the hospital to this other place. So there was almost two 
sides sides to me and and the people around me were actually also learning they were also crumbling and they also had strong pain bodies you know my mom uh when she was brought into this world she had pain young she lost her dad very young her mom was made some questionable decisions in her life and had abandoned my mom so my mom lived her whole entire life feeling abandoned and you know there's so many stories that I can and talk but basically it it built in me this fear of abandonment that I needed to live a certain way and for me I was surrounded by men um which was great. So I was always on the farm. I was around my grandfather and my father and my great grandfather. I spent a lot of time with him. He was a carpenter. He liked to build and I would spend time with him filing saws and building things. So he showed me how to work with tools and he also inspired me to work uh, for him. He used to pay me for jobs like cleaning the car, cleaning the breezeway and uh, you know, those sort of things, you know, mowing the lawn and, you know, so if it wasn't for that, you know, I just, it was, it was, it was what I needed for, for an education, um, because I hated school, which is another story altogether. So when I became in this pain body and when I felt my life was broke and I was just a human doing things to survive and, and get through things. Everything was hard. It was like paddling a canoe up a waterfall. And it didn't matter how I mapped that out. It just was always hard, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I started reading books. This is where it gets exciting. And this is what I want to really share because this is my superpower is sharing sacred space about these growth moments, dark nights of the soul, things that we barely get through, to tell you quite honestly. Um, so things changed when 9-11 happened for me. I was addicted to drugs. So at this point, my son is in elementary school. I'm going to estimate maybe grade three or four. I was... Uh, addicted to weed and a variety of pills. So my addiction started with experimentation with weed when I was very young and cigarettes and coffee. And then when I was 16 years old, I got my wisdom teeth out and my doctor prescribed Tylenol 3. So that was my first introduction to finding a way to eliminate and comfort my emotional pain. And when I had my wisdom teeth out, I also got a staph infection. So infection ran through my body. I had a fever of over a hundred. Uh, my life wasn't going good. I got some Tylenol three and it literally one prescription started a chain of events that just spiraled. So after I got my wisdom teeth out, I started with Tylenol 3s. And then very slowly but surely, you know, I was surrounded by, you know, working people, people that were truckers, people that were musicians and creative, creative people. And, and in my community, it was very common to do all kinds of drugs, I mean, it was just, I mean, we did mushrooms, we did LSD, you, it, you know, it was just, that was what was available to us. So during that young time, at a young age, like leaving elementary school, early high school, I was already experimenting with magic mushrooms, LSD, um, higher powerful, more powerful drugs, and they were readily available to me. It wasn't a secret either. Uh, I've got stories to share there, which we'll maybe share, maybe not. Everybody has their own. Uh, so time goes on. 
Uh, it's 9-11. At this point, I've tried cocaine, heroin, mescaline, uh, Benny, you know, some more prescription drugs as, as well, you know. So, during that time, when I was still being a human being, there was this terminology that people used for, you know, people on welfare, you know, single moms, and uh, people that did drugs, too, you know. So, once you started using heavier drugs, you were classified as either a crackhead, if you use crack, or uh, a junkie. And junkies in my human conditioning and circle... I mean, they were the worst of the worst. Those were the intravenous drug users, you know, and I knew, I knew I didn't want to be one of those. Um, so terminology was kind of being thrown around, didn't have a relationship with myself, was working my guts out to be a better person because it was the right thing to do. I hated myself. I hated everybody around me. I wanted to be a good mom. So that was my integrity. That was what was in my heart. I knew that I wanted my son to have structure like I didn't. I knew that I did not want to break his life. So I didn't have great examples with learning. So I had to find mentors and examples. So this, this should be exciting. I want this to be exciting for you. So if you have any of these issues that I'm talking about, Things change and it changes literally with awareness that you want to change. So back to 9-11, I was addicted to alcohol, crack, cocaine. You know, I was actually a closet addict. So therefore, I was willing to do drugs alone. I didn't want to include anybody else in my shit show. You'd, I didn't want my son to know that his mom was broken and didn't know how to fix shit, you know, so you know, I would just do drugs alone, you know, I'd go and party and that sort of thing, but I was also doing self-harm to myself by doing drugs when I was alone, so it was very common before I was going to bed to, you know, I mean, create cocktails for everything. I mean, I had a cocktail for every moment of my life, whether I was going out, whether I was having fun, uppers, downers, inners, outers, so on and so forth. So, so much so that I had my blood work done at one point during this whole time before 9-11, around 9-11. Um, some dramatic things were impacting my life. One was hepatitis was running rapid in the place where I live you know, and I had com some concerns about my behavior that might get me in physical body trouble. So I went to a doctor and I had blood work done to see if I was okay, because I also had a friend during this time that was diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, um, as well as many friends diagnosed with hepatitis. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, this road of being human is leading me to self-destruction and, and so on and so forth. So around 9-11, that's where I was. I was getting blood work done. My doctor said to me, wow, you know, wow, your addictions are bad. You know, according to this blood work, you should practically glow in the dark. And we, you know, I think it's important that you get some help. So I went to uh, rehab, I joined some programs that were available to me, you know, in my community with community services and so on and so forth. And I have a very strong opinion about all these services that was provided to me during this time. So needless to say, that didn't work for me. So I, I also went to AA, I did this 12 steps, I did everything. So 9-11 happened. When 9-11 happened, I was at my house. Um, my relationship was destroyed. The person that I loved was addicted to intravenous drug use and prescription drugs. And it was bad. So I'm watching the news and I see 
what's happening. I see the planes hit the twin towers. But what happened inside of me snapped. In that moment, in 2012, I looked at my life completely different. And I made a decision. And that one decision was, I'm sick of this shit. I'm sick of this shit. I hate this. I hate this. I don't like this. So I broke up with myself, who I thought I was. I broke up with myself and the bullshit story that was attached to it. The whole story and idea that life had to be hard. Money doesn't grow on trees. Anybody that's rich has manipulated people. I mean, there's just so many, so many things. So what I started doing was reading different books. So when I was a human being, I was reading books like on murder and mass murder and serial killers. And, you know, I really love that stuff. Actually, I was writing pen pal letters to people in prison to engage with them because I wanted to understand why people change, what makes people change from their pain body and their shit story to live in the life of their dreams. Like, you know, Oprah Winfrey's, you know, big for me. I'll use her for a lot of examples, but let's just use her here, you know, like Oprah Winfrey. So in that moment in 2012, I promised myself a few things. The first thing I promised myself was I was going to un become so devoted to my personal self-growth that my son would never have to worry about the things I had to worry about. I made a decision that I wasn't going to contribute to enabling my own habits anymore. I was going to surround myself as best I could by people that supported that decision, which took a lot of years, like 12, maybe 12 years, yeah, give or take. It was a long time. So people that say, you know, that are addicted and they're like, just stop, you know, just stop, stop the drugs. You know, they don't realize that it's years of conditioning and the whole time people are addicted to drugs, they're trying to find comfort. They're trying to find a cozy cushion. They're trying to find a soft place to fall. They're trying to be understood. They're trying to be seen and heard and loved because nobody wants to feel broke, abandoned, left behind, and that life is hard and it's going to go nowhere. So I made the decision. I wanted to be the best mom possible. I was going to dedicate myself to my self-growth. And I wasn't going to believe my human conditioning anymore. Because I remembered when the tw Twin Towers were hit. I very quickly remembered who the fuck I was when I was five years old. Before I was broke. And I thought, huh, before I was broke, I had the power to expand time. My world was colorful and magical and mysterious and the coolest things happened. I have the best stories and I love telling stories. And I remembered that I had the power to experience fire within my soul to stand up for myself and trust myself and I had intuition and I had abilities that I was reminded of of how I knew things and how I educated myself and what I liked and didn't like and I also had rem I, I remember too how when I was five, life was effortless. And it wasn't because people cared for me and they did everything for me. And I was just a little kid and I didn't know any different. 
it was because I didn't allow anybody, including my parents, to tell me I couldn't do something. So I made a decision that instead of being a human doing, I was going to nurture my human being. So I went from reading books about serial killers to reading books about energy, energy medicine, uh, yoga, the human body. So I was reading medical journals on depression, anxiety, brain disorders. I was learning uh, about near-death experience, I was learning about cancer, I decided that I wanted to become a healer. I knew I was a healer when I was a young girl. I knew that I wanted to be a healer. I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to heal medicine. I wanted to be in the healing arts and healing medicine, and I wanted to work with animals. But when I got older and I looked at the people around me and how much pain they were in and the things they were doing, and the life experiences I was having as a result of their pain and that sort of thing, I, I just started going inside and becoming a human being and developing myself. What, what, what meant something to me? And then I put on this armor. And this took a lot of help. This took a lot of people. I specifically started choosing everything in my life from where I worked I was heavily addicted and this is a cool story I you know I, I knew I needed another job I was cleaning houses but I needed another job so I applied for some jobs and I thought okay well I want to do what I love I love coffee so I applied at a Tim Hortons I also love Tim Hortons which is a fantastic story I hope to share someday I have a couple of Tim Hortons stories anyway so and I also applied at a franchise, Curse for Women, because I love exercise, you know. Um, and I love the human body. I love beautiful people. I love muscles. I love good conditioning. I love it when people take care of themselves. I, I wanted to see more of that myself, and I wanted to see more of it in the world. So I applied for Curse for Women, and I applied for uh, Tim Hortons, and I didn't hear anything. So I thought, okay, well, so I thought, what else do I love? So I got a job at a music academy. I worked for a lady that had a home-based business. She was an entrepreneur, and I, uh, I, worked, I worked for her clean, you know, in the office, making appointments and doing deposits. So I was entrusted with her business, which meant a lot to me. Unfortunately, I was still working on my human being and was still a human doing. So I had bad habits, like smoking a shit ton of pot before I went to work at her home-based business. So I probably went in smelling like a skunk, which she was, she did the best she could with that. She, she was not, you know, a pot smoker, a drug doer. So, you know, she started paying attention, I believe. And I also cleaned her house too. So, you know, there were, we developed a very good relationship and she was the first person kind of, um, that I worked for outside of my family and my, my life as a mom. And so during this time, uh, she had given me a book and she was like, Natasha, I really think you should, should read this book. And I was starting to read a lot of spiritual literature and self-help and everything. And uh, so I was starting to go to the library and read. Like, I would come back from the library with, I'm telling you, like, ten books. I would read a book a, a week. <clears throat> so she, she gave me this book, Conversations with God, and I started reading Conversations with God. And I was about a chapter in when the Twin Towers were struck and I just had this totally blow up of awareness and consciousness of being a human being and how everything affected everything and I started sorting my life you know and so 
I was approximately 26 years old then. I'm 47 now, and I'm here to tell you that that process never stops for me, and I'm glad it doesn't. You know, so we're, we're always learning and we're always changing, we're always evolving and we're always becoming more. And, and so I, that, that has become very exciting for me. So it's led into my, my, my business. So, which is the sacred space of the cozy cushion where we talk about these spiritual experiences that you, you have that are similar to mine and, you know, we try to get some healing done as fast as possible. And that's why I started this YouTube channel is because I needed a sacred space now. Not the one I dream about, the gym I'm going to create where I'm going to invite you all to come and exercise and do more of the things I love. But the sacred space of here now and holding light and energy for you to heal and transform into a human being, you know, and, and that's di absolutely different for everybody, you know. Um, so after spending a morning walking around, at, let me tell you about last night. Last night, I couldn't sleep. So normally, when I was a human doing, I couldn't sleep because I was anxious, depressed, and loopy thoughts would just run through my head. You know, what I didn't do, what, you know, was my fault? Whose fault was it? Why, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was just torment. It was actually really dreadful. So if any of you are here with loopy thoughts and dreadfulness, just know that there is hope. <laughs> there is. And, 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 and you can educate yourself and build a map to get yourself out of this fucking shit show. Trust me. Um, so when I became a human being last night, I was awake all night in gratitude. I was grateful for my 17 year old son because there's somebody in our community that just lost their, their 17 year old, you know? So I'm grateful for that. And, um... I'm also grateful for my partner in life. You know, we do a lot of things together and we've done a lot of growing together and I'm so grateful that I'm so closely connected with him, not only on a human doing level, because we've done a lot of things together, but now we're human beings together. And that journey was freaking ugly. It was so ugly. So let it, mm. I'll be sharing some stories about that very gently. So then, during this experience, becoming a human being, I also learned that thoughts become things. So I'd have thought, you know, okay, I need a job. I want to work at doing something I love. I applied for two jobs, and uh, nobody called me for a year. A whole year goes by of me doing my thing, thinking, you know, I'm not going to get hired, you know, that sort of thing. I took my resumes in. I went to those places and said, hey, I'm the human being. I applied for a job. So I followed up and everything. So the same day, I get two emails, one from Tim Hortons. They said, can you please come in for an interview? And I said, absolutely. So I was like, oh my God, you know, I can get a job. And then uh, Curves also sent a message, said, hey, we need you to come in. Would you like to come in for an interview? So I said, okay. So the same day, I went for two interviews. I went to Tim Hortons, and the lady was really, she was like, look, do you want a job? And I was like, yes. She goes, okay, good. This is what you need to do. Show up, cold, really, you know, no love, no compassion, you know. Uh, full-time hours, benefits, this, that, and the other thing. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, I think this would be awesome. I love coffee, so, you know, that's totally up my alley. So then I went to my job, uh, my interview at Curves for Women. And I met this lady um, 
she did an interview. She was very sweet. And uh, she just looked at me like I really meant something. I'm going to cry. I really meant something to her. And she really, she gave a shit. She cared about whether I showed up. So she had said to me, look, I'm going to tell the owner of Curves about you. And I really think this job would be good for you. And, uh, you know, I think you're perfect for the job. This is what you have to do. You have to exercise. Now, at this point in my life, my idea of exercise was fist fighting at a bar. And uh, huh, being able to hold my own. You know, that was my idea of exercise. And uh, so she was like, look, you know, this, this, this is great. You, you, you know, you should work for us. And I was like, no. First of all, I don't know anything about exercise. I kind of freaked myself out. I had that thought, the human conditioning, a human being stepped in and said, like, Natasha, you don't know anything. This is a franchise. These people are all about this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, just take the job at Tim Hortons. Coffee's easy. And, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So I call the manager at Curbs and I say, you know, look, you know, thank you so much for the interview. It was great to meet you. I appreciate your kindness and everything. But, you know, I'm going to take the job at Tim Hortons. And she was like, yeah, that's not really, you know, that's not okay. We kind of need you. When I talked to the owner, she said, if you don't have three heads to hire you, so I want to hire you. And I felt bad. I was like, okay, this person really needs me. Tim Hortons kind of treated me like I was like, you know, okay, well, if you want a job, here's one. This person was like, no, we really need you. We want you here. So I was like, okay, they want me there. So I went to my first, I, I so I accepted the job after 9-11 when I was getting my shit together and I was still addicted. So heavily addicted, I might add. And uh, so I went to my first day of work and so I was in the center Curves for Women is a franchise for those of you that don't know and my job was to stand in the center of a room surrounded by exercise equipment and entertain people and encourage them to exercise and get more bang for their back in 30 minutes stretch them out and send them home so there was a lot of scripts a lot of uh, there was a map. There was a, a, a concrete franchise written map that Gary Haven created for the Curves franchise. He has a great story. It's about his mom and what she needed in life. It wasn't available, so he created it. So I was like, that's cool. So in the center of this circuit, my manager noticed that I was ruining shirts we had a lot of white shirts and I would sweat a lot like I'm sweating right now but it's menopause completely different so I would I would sweat I would shake I would be sick often you know um not not sick from work but literally be in the center of the circuit be okay one minute and totally not okay the next and I worked long hours I every day I worked was eight hour shifts and I loved absolutely every single second so my first day of work I had this idea it just hit me like out of nowhere I was in the center of the circuit surrounded by women which I had issues with I had issues with women heavy issues with women at this point I didn't trust women honestly I didn't like them I had a very masculine personality, so I had a kind of a fuck you, I'll do what I want, you know, attitude, which wasn't serving me. So my manager noticed that I was ruining shirts, like, bad. Like, I had armpit, embarrassing armpit stains because my body, when I was exercising, was physically detoxing. So many toxins from my body, my sweat was green and yellow and brown and it was staining my shirts like you couldn't you couldn't wash this 
toxicity out with Javix. And I'm, I'm not even joking. So, she basically just kind of made it easy for me to have new shirts, you know. And, and good thing for me in fitness franchising, we were always, we were always creating new promotions, new ideas, new things to do. So when it was available to me to have these new shirts, so it wasn't embarrassing, um, it wasn't brought to my attention, you know, like, you know, is, Natasha, is there anything you need help with? Like, you know, because uh, to me it was obvious, you know. And so long story short, I made a decision that every day I went to Curves that I would minimize my own addiction a little by little in a way I could process in a way that didn't freak me out and you know um so I did that little by little and every day got better and better in every way and you know I started reading things I was surrounding myself by more positive people and that's where my great moment happened you know I was in the center of this circuit and I had this sense of peace and this knowing that all the healing that I needed was going to come to me and that I was going to create this place called the cozy cushion, just like this place that found, that I found. So the ironic part about the, the why I stayed with curves wasn't the fitness. It wasn't that I loved it. It was because the owner was one of the strongest admirable woman women that I thought two women actually the the manager and the owner were two independent women independent thinkers my manager was a teacher she taught elementary school and she was retired curves was her retirement job the owner was a police officer's wife in my mind I knew it was a good place for me because if I continued being a human doing it was going to be a completely different life that probably involved her husband more than her, so to speak. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to stay here because it's going to keep me in check, which became a very interesting theme for my life, honestly, because, you know, I, I started healing myself. I started minimizing my addiction and it was constant I'm not going to say battle anymore but it was a constant series of making decisions and how I did that was what is I would ask myself what is the next best right move for me not my son not the people in my lives me what is meaningful to me so I started doing those things you know so there was some hardships in between there. So yesterday in my video, I talked about my dreams and how now, how I behave with those. But it's as a result of all these learning experience and all the things that happen in between. And I'll share stories as we go, just so you can relate to me as a human being. And so you know that my sacred safe space is safe. And also so you know that I have sacred medicine to offer. So this morning when I was doing my research, I'm going to end my video because I can talk forever and that's not my intention. My intention is to engage and share. So this morning when I made the decision to make this video, I wanted to touch base on this simple principle uh, from my mentor, Sean Stevenson. Uh, and he, I got this quote in my email uh, this morning and it says, Doing the right thing isn't easy. It's usually mocked. And sometimes we're all alone when we choose it. Do it anyway. I'd read a quote similar to this way back when, my first job at the Music Academy, before Curves, this lady gave me a book, Conversations with God, I read something to the lines of this which sparked joy in me because I knew there was a way through this life that was different than what I was living. 
So that's what I wanted to share with you today is that when you're making decisions and we have families and we have loved ones and we have people and we have dogs and, and those sort of things, when we make our decisions and we feel like we're alone, let that be a strength. Let that be okay. It took me all these years to give myself permission to stand in my decisions, claim my space in time, and honor my sacred medicine so that I didn't die like my mom in her pain body. So I'm just going to leave you with that thought today that you're worth it. You deserve a good life. You deserve to figure this the fuck out. There's support for you. Even though you're going to feel alone, you're not alone. Like, I wasn't alone. And there's great love for you here. Thank you for listening. Thank, for, thank you for staying till the end. I hope to see you next Ruby Tuesday. And take good care of yourself. You're the only one that can do it. And you're going to appreciate me someday for giving you permission for doing so. Enjoy your day. Stay safe.